Hi guys, my name is Subtutor, I'm the man on the Silver Mountain and welcome back. Now today I got a request to talk about uh, a story that's that's kind of been kind of rolling along a little bit the last week or so uh, at the time of me recording this, which is that Cancer UK put out a, a new campaign pointing out that the, the second most prevalent cause of cancer in the UK is... Um, is obesity is is being overweight and they they showed reasons for this they they put forward the statistics and apparently there were a lot of people that, that saw this as fat shaming including one particularly prominent individual who's apparently an award-winning comedian called Sophie Hagen who's a year younger than me and strongly condemned the campaign as being incredibly damaging with tweets like um, she she puts up part of their compare picture of their campaign and goes right is anyone currently working to get this piece of shit cancer research uk advert removed from everywhere is there something i can sign how the fucking fuck is this okay and it's like well because it's fact dear and that's what we're going to go through in this video because the first thing is i want to talk about um how the uh, the the whole thing works. So why is it so prevalent? Why have we got these these uh, this being the second most um, kind of uh, second biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking? Um, then I want to talk about how that actually comes about, how it works. Uh, I'm going to give a, a single example, but there are many others that have been uh, circulated. And then I want to go back to the actual story, see what Cancer UK have said, and then conclude around kind of the, the overall commentary and, and stuff that's been going on with this and how this is, this is not healthy for anybody. <laughs> um, so to kick off with, firstly, oh, pardon me. How could being overweight cause cancer? Well, Cancer Research UK, thankfully, put out a little infographic about this, uh, along with some other literature, going, well, okay, so there are basically four steps to it. And I'll go into a, an example of how this affects otherwise. And they go, okay, so first off, fat cells make extra hormones and growth factors, which I'll give an example of once I've gone through these four steps. Uh, the hormones the, and growth factors tell cells in your body to divide more often. They tell you them, them to, to grow, to generate, you know, um, at which point then if you've got a cell which has DNA damage, you know, the, from smoking, from exposure to the sun, from, from a natural predisposition, from anything, then those growth factors are going to tell that cell to reproduce more. And that's how you get that damaged cluster of cells that then become a tumour, be it, be it benign or malignant. You're going to have it grow. And as a result, that's the way it works. And that's why, especially with there being so much crappy food around and, and people always being in a rush and so not being able to, to monitor their diet as effectively or going from... from one environment to another where their lifestyle changes significantly and as a result like myself you know putting on um extra weight after moving from a very active uh, physically active straining environment into one that is much more sedentary you know you've you've got that shift where the the fat consumption isn't necessarily being used up the the growth factors aren't necessarily going towards repair and so there's there are things to be taken into consideration there um, in which case, then, the the example that I want to talk about here is, is one that gets talked about a lot in fitness circles, but is one also that I took a look at when I was learning kind of uh, biology in high school, uh, essentially, um, in secondary school. And that is the, the link between fats and testos testosterone generation. And, you know, there, there are lots of different things you can say about fats, and there are lots of different types of fat. Um, but ultimately, whilst they all, to one extent or another, have some kind of positive benefits to our body as um, things to be kind of taken on board and used up, and obviously they've got these elements that, that allow for growth, for generation, for, for an energy store and all that kind of thing, um, having too much of a good thing will still be a bad thing. And yet, there have been numerous studies, with a couple of which I'll, I'll cite in a minute, 
um, that have all linked fat consumption to testosterone. Um, and so as a result, for instance, um, they, they did a study a while ago, I don't know what year this was, but Dorgan et al. randomly assigned 45 men to either a high fat or a low fat diet, um, or a, sorry, a high fat or a low, f and a low fiber diet, or a low fat and a high fiber diet. The subjects f uh, that followed each diet for 10 weeks, the high fat, low fiber diet yielded a 13% higher level of general testosterone compared to, to others. And, you know, we, we see this a lot where uh, male vegetarians have shown been, been shown time and time again to have lower levels of, of kind of blood testosterone, uh, plasma testosterone compared to their meat eating counterparts or their omnivorous counterparts. And, you know, we we see that time and time again in, in numerous different studies. Now, breaking down which fats affect the generation of testosterone and stuff you know that that's a, a more difficult thing and it's been a bit of a muddy area because you've got so many different types of fat that are all being consumed at once in many instances and so trying to divide between each of those can be difficult but it still comes down to the fact that fat has a, a purpose and in regards to testosterone this is where we get to the growth factors and hormones element because everyone knows that testosterone is a hormone but not everyone and they realize that it's it's attached more to men than women as it's an androgen but they don't realize necessarily that it's an anabolic steroid a naturally occurring anabolic steroid those things that the the synthetic equivalent people take to help them build muscle why because it allows for the the clumping together um, of, of various bits and pieces and the extra extra generation of proteins in cells for growth for instance in in particular in skeletal muscle and so as a result if you if you were eating a lot of fat increasing your your testosterone generation um, to to do take hold as it's with its anabolic effects to grow muscle to grow tissue and one cell or a handful of cells that were damaged had damaged dna in them turned up started to replicate then yeah, you'd probably have some kind of tumor or, or, or growth in you so that would probably not be beneficial to you as it would be using up resources and growing in a way that, that would then potentially take up other resources from other areas or limit what your body is doing or just straight up, as we see with many cancers, cause other parts of your body to fail. And so, you know, they're, they're very legitimate uh, reasons and causes and that's only one example that's more male focused granted but that's one very that's one very prominent example of how fat consumption then affects your your uh, hormonal levels and your your kind of growth factors um, as they put it which then goes on to the creation of tumors with with kind of not much else in the way and obviously the people who are um in the the kind of category of obese person um, are the people who are likely to be cons most likely to be consuming um, a lot more fats and having a lot more fat stored and so as a result those things are going to be the the overall impacting factors stating that is scientific fact and as a result it's not fat shaming it's a case of going this is the case this is how your body works it's fact you can't get upset about fact. Why? Because it's the same for everybody, whatever you believe. So then, let's come back to, to this actual situation where you've got this outspoken, whiny comedian. Who, you, being a comedian, you would have thought maybe would have more in the way of a, a thick skin or an appreciation of, of the world generally. Because you have to observe and be aware to then make jokes but uh, apparently not. And so then we've got people saying, you, you've got her complaining about BMI and it's been debunked and it's like, yes, okay, that's fine. BMI has been debunked. It's not a very good measure. However, you can still, because you know you can be a big person, a tall person or a short person with a big weight that's all muscle that then gets weighed and it will tell you that you're obese because your weight and height don't match up. So BMI, not great, it's crap. Um, however, that's that's fine. We can dismiss that. But she goes, 
BMI has been debunked decades ago. It's not a valid way of measuring anything. On the contrary, dieting has been proved time and time again to be one of the worst things you can do to your body. Your, uh, your campaign is so damaging and fat shaming and I really hope it gets taken down. And it's like, well, okay, fine. So if you don't want to diet though, then maintain your, your current diet, sure, and increase your level of exercise, focusing on the places that, that would burn or the exercises that would burn more faster you know as i've said in other videos um if you want to be uh if you want to just enjoy your diet if you want to just do whatever it is that you want to do absolutely fine all power to you however there is there is one specific thing that you need to pay attention to and that is being functional if you can be a bit heavier enjoy the the lifestyle you lead with the food that you eat and the things that you do but then you can still go and do the things that you want to do, go and enjoy life with other people, function in a way that isn't going to impact your health, shorten your life, all of those kind of things. Again, that's fine. It's when you find people who run into those roadblocks of going, oh, well, I can't do that because I'm too heavy. I can't come and join you because I'm too heavy. I can't go and do this or that or the other. And it's a case of going, okay, fine so what's more important to you your diet and your your um ability to say look at me i'm i'm fat and i'm proud or your health your your quality of life your interactions with other people the things that you can do you know it it, it comes down to those kind of things so <sighs> it's it's a set of various issues here that can be easily dismissed with just a little bit of look uh, a little bit of looking into the science behind it because it is just fact but let's see what the accused say because obviously cancer uk have kind of thrown out this campaign to try and help people because that's what they do and so let's take a look at one of the statements that they've put out they've gone the first one was from um the charity's director of prevention alison cox who says oh excuse me who says being overweight in the UK in, is the UK's biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking, but most people don't know about the substantial risk. If more people became aware of the link, it may help spare not just millennials, but all generations from cancer. Because obviously you could be approaching that point where your growth factors and whatever else are impacting these cells, and yet then you could potentially dial back, you could get fitter, you could get healthier. And as a result, those first few cells that maybe start to replicate get wiped out by your body anyway because they're no longer being fed those additional growth factors and things because that has all been channeled towards other areas of your body as a result of exercise, as a result of other things, as a result of you uh, improving your lifestyle, consuming less fat, doing whatever, you know, however it is that you want to manage it. Um, and then we've got another statement um, where you've got Professor Linda Bald, who is the Cancer Research UK's prevention expert, saying, the aim of the charity's campaign is to raise awareness of the fact that obesity is the biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking. This is not about fat shaming, which is ridiculous anyway. It is based on scientific evidence and designed to give important information to the public. Only 50%, 15% of people are aware that obesity is a cause of cancer. Cancer Research UK has a duty to put that message into the public domain. In addition to raising awareness, the campaign aims to help stem the rising tide of obesity by urging the government to create a climate that makes healthier food choices easier for everyone. And so whilst that last bit seems a little bit tough, because obviously there's only so much that the, uh, the government can and to be fair should be able to do to impact people's choices within their their food within their lives um in regards to everything else in that statement um i'm uh, and when i said the, the the fat shaming thing is is ridiculous i mean in, in regards to this thing there are people for instance when i was a kid and i was fat um there are people that will mock you that will, will tease you that will harm attempt to harm you and and ridicule you in various ways that you do not deserve especially when you're a child because I, I was eating more sure than some others but I was also a bigger kid than most others and as soon as I ended as soon as I got to the end of school I got crazy crazy tall compared to what I was before very very quickly and thinned down a lot and so 
you know, now it's a, it's a case of, yeah, okay, allow people to grow and develop, encourage them to do better and to see the other side of it, you know, rather than smacking them with it because that, that negativity keeps them in that place and all the rest of it. To me, it sounds like, what was her name? Sophie Hagen? Yeah, sounds to me like she just enjoys not just being fat, but being able to attack other people for um, questioning her own narrative. Um, and so when you've got an expert who and, and a charity that focuses around this stuff going, look, it's, it's scientific evidence. Only 15% of people, as far as we're aware, knows of this as a cause, in which case we have a duty to tell them. And on top of that, it's a case of, again, this is a, a more left-wing spin on people not wanting to listen to experts anymore. And these and, and not willing to adhere to facts because of their feelings. You know, she reads this and she sees that it's it's this attack on her when it's not. It's incredibly vague statements about scientific fact, about the way that people's bodies work. It's not a directed attack at her. They don't say Sophie Hagen is fat and therefore likely to get cancer. They go, everyone is more likely to get cancer because the numbers show it. Um, and so, you know, it's it's one of these things that the, it, it winds me up because, again, it's a case of going, you need to pay attention to the world around you, to the facts, to the evidence, to the things that are most important. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't filter facts because as, as said, you know, there is some information that says that certain types of fats are better. You've got things like what coconut oil and coconut, um, oh Christ, what's it called? Coconut butter and all that kind of stuff that is, um, has been, even though it's a saturated fat, it's been given all of these, these kind of magical miracle claims in regards to one thing or another, the... I did a little bit of, of digging before recording this, before saying this, and there doesn't seem to be an awful lot for some of those claims. Some of them, sure, absolutely. You know, rub it on your head, makes your head feel better. Um, you know, gets rid of dried skin, whatever, all that kind of stuff. There's some evidence for that. In regards to some of its other things, though, like it's apparently an antimicrobial. Really? Really? I would have thought that considering it's a big fat thing and that coconuts still rot and decay, the... It, it would still just it's a big fat source it's an energy source you'd have stuff consuming it that, that, that sounds like bo bollocks to me um so and and again i couldn't find any actual scientifically supported information to suggest that that was the case for instance um but again it's it's this isn't fat shaming stop being so sensitive if it's a fact it's a fact what you do with that fact is still up to you as said, they have a duty to put this in the public domain and they have a duty to make people aware. So let's say that another, I don't know, 50% of people on top of the 15 already become aware. So you've got 65% of people in the UK populace that are now aware of obesity as a potential thing that, that will call, call, generate a higher instance of cancer. In which case, though, let's say that only about 25% of those people go, oh, well, that means I'm going to lose weight because of, of a necessity, because I want to, because I need to, because I don't want to be at risk, because I was going to do it anyway, but this just gives me another reason. You know, that still leaves you like 45% of people that might try and then not, or might do this and then not, might not be bothered about it at all. Um, and all that kind of thing and it becomes a case of going just because the facts are out there doesn't mean you need to interact with them doesn't mean you need to do anything so Sophie Hagen being so selfish and so self-centered to to go oh we need to get rid of all of this well that's that's fine you can easily not look at it you can easily walk past it you can easily ignore it you cannot act on it even if you've been made aware of it if you're completely happy with your life and the way that it's working that's fine but good God, woman, you're not you're not everybody. You can't be everybody. And there are some people who are going to be helped by this. You know, if, if being fat is so important to you, fine. In, enjoy it. Live your life. Continue to achieve your goals in the way that you want to, in the way that you are. Fine. 
but that doesn't mean that this wouldn't actually help people's lives just by raising awareness. I talk an awful lot about raising awareness and paying attention to things that are going on around you and being able to filter fact from, from falsehood. Here you are being presented with actual scientific fact from a body that works scientifically because they, they do the research into, you know, they, they fund the research and they supply the research that into these areas that are killing hundreds of people every year, thousands of people every year. You know, they, they have to work with facts and science because otherwise they're not actually going to be able to help anybody. You know, they're not, if they've got a collection of different potential treatments in front of them that they want to put money towards, they need to look at the ones that are most viable and the ones that are most viable are the ones that are going to have the most easily, sorry, easily replicable, replicable and potent scientific results. That's what they have to work with. That's what they're doing. Fuck's sake, listen. But anyway, guys, I'd love to know what your thoughts are because, you know, especially in kind of Western countries, um, I remember when I was over in Australia a few years ago, uh, well, quite a few years ago, to be fair, um, there were uh, stats being shown everywhere about the, the country's 50% obesity rate and how effective obesity rate and how they were trying to, to manage that and improve things over there. And so, again, it's a case of going, right, well, yeah, this isn't just a, a UK-based problem. It isn't just a, a kind of Western world problem, even. You know, we are seeing these things happen in places like Japan as well, where obesity has become a not as prominent issue, but a, a rising issue overall. Uh, and it's it's a case of, yeah, you've got all of these, these areas where this is a, a thing, and it could really horrifically impact people's lives and the people that are working on it are then being met with criticism by people who are you know I, I don't care if you're a comedian how does that make you in any way qualified you can be comedian and you can be fat great those two things all power to you you've you've managed to generate a, an interesting life for yourself with an interesting profession and you are have decided to manage your life in a way that you've got a few extra pounds fine however how does that make you in any way qualified to challenge scientific fact that are generated by experts over numerous pieces of research that can be very easily proven? As said, with testosterone being an anabolic steroid, heightened testosterone, meaning heightened kind of mus muscular growth, and, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, how, who are you to contest that? You know, it's, it's uh, an interesting delusion that you would have to have to try and compete with that purely on the grounds of oh it's shaming me for being bigger than everyone else no nowhere in this and nowhere in here does it even specifically say that it is bad it just says this has a higher likelihood of leading to this that's just truth it doesn't say you have to lose weight and we're going to make you lose weight it doesn't say that if you're fat you're bad or anything like that it just says this can cause this. Please be aware of it, just in case. Simple, right? Not not difficult, not offensive, not hard. Even the adverts were just like, you know, what's the second biggest cause of obesity? Or what's the big, second biggest cause of cancer? And then it was like a hangman's thing with just obesity half spelled out. You know, how is that offensive? It's words on a fucking board. Anyway... Um, I'd love to know your thoughts, guys, because this is, this is you know, I, I was big. I was bullied when I was a kid because I was fat uh, to one extent or another. Um, I got thinner, fitter, happier, all the rest of it, and then I've changed my lifestyle. I've been doing these videos for you guys. I've been coaching people much more sedentary lifestyle than shifting huge amounts of stock every morning at 5 a.m. And, and, and dealing with long trips up and back, up and down into London and whatever else. So, you know, as a result, as I mentioned in other videos, I put on a few pounds. And so what it comes down to, though, guys, you know, if you're aware of it, you can tackle the problem, you can plan to solve the problem, you can deal with it, whatever. If people aren't aware of this as a, as a factor for them and their potential risk of cancer, if they know that they are otherwise already predisposed to cancer, then it's not going to help. They need to be aware so that they can plan and work accordingly. But anyway, guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, especially around the, the again, the kind of sensitivity around certain subjects. 
you know, and how people are so willing to ignore experts and people that work firmly within the the confines of reality because they have no other choice. Even if they would maybe prefer to do otherwise, they have no other choice. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that, but also just on this specific situation. Have you seen these adverts? You know, even when I've been rumbling around, I've not seen even seen any of these adverts. So I, the prevalence has to be purely in this one person's life for them to flip out about it. So either way, guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the video tomorrow. Take care. Thank you very much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed this video, then please drop us a like, share this video, and subscribe for more, and I'll see you in the video tomorrow. Take care.